on this episode of Skeptico, a show about love in the extended consciousness realm. We can't directly establish causation, right? If you look at what Richard Dolan was describing of the tall greys and the reported experiences of these people of overwhelming love, and you compare this to the near-death experience reports of this overwhelming love, and then you look at, for instance, the New Testament, and it's all about love, love is all that matters. We also look at the um, counterculture in the 60s, 1960s with the Beatles, all you need is love. And I just started to get a little bit suspicious of this. Why is it always just love? Why is it all only about that and not about, for instance, material accomplishments in this world? Why is it always just love? And why we might not want to go all fanboy on the love thing. Hey, uh, remember when uh, you were in the, the Beatles and uh, you did that um, album, Abbey Road? And uh, the song it goes, uh, and in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. You, you remember that? <laughs> yes. Uh, is that true? Yes, Chris, in, in my experience it is, I find the more you give, the more you get. <sighs> I have an interview coming up in a minute with Nelson, insert pseudo name there, who did just a fantastic interview with me a couple months ago. I have no idea why I sat on this as long as I did. It's actually so good that I've broken it up into two parts because we talk about so many things and we talk about this other subject we'll kind of hint at at the end, but it's so different that I wanted to break it into a separate episode. But anyway, all this other great stuff is coming up now in my interview with Nelson. We roll right into this. So I will say, welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris. And today we welcome a guy who just amazing to me that Nelson found the show and then found me through the forum. I feel so grateful to have connected with him. He's so smart and has brought so many brilliant, new, fresh ideas to the table. This kind of level three discussion is exactly what I love to do in these shows. So he doesn't have a website. He doesn't have a book yet. He's just a really, really smart guy. And I hope you enjoy this dialogue with him. Is that all right with you then? Just if we, because I've, I've written notes just the, the the highlights of this and you remember our discussions way back because you know Anna she was doing the the website for the Facebook site and the YouTube videos and yeah. I mean so we go way back we go way back my man so you know we we ought to start with I mean that's 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 just enough of a reason to chat uh, what what really just totally blew my mind is when you sent the latest thing about the slave mentality in the, the yeah. Romans, because it, it just rings true. And there's a lot of subtle things to unravel there. You know, we, we ought to start with kind of who you are and your background. And then I, I think, I just don't know where to go on the Bledsoe thing. We'll just do it. And then if it's okay with you, I might not go forward with that mm -hmm. just because all the reasons I told you, but I'd love to have that chat with you. So Nelson, sure. you're here. Tell, tell, tell me a little bit about, I really don't know or can't remember much about your background. Tell me. Yeah, so it's, uh, I'm a classical scholar, so ancient Greece and Rome, and was a researcher and tutor in different universities in New Zealand with this. And it was really just an amazing time just to be with old school professors who really respected just the ancient history and the cultures and the ancient religions. But then I noticed that the new blood within the system, these new professors, they were more and more ideological and they were labeling, for instance, the ancient religions as just superstition, not to be taken seriously. And the entire aesthetic of the art, for instance, I was a paid researcher in ancient Greek bars paintings and 
I just noticed that this was all being corrupted. And I just really wanted to just focus on the ancient world and just to immerse myself into this uh, way of thinking in this material culture. And so my professors, for instance, they said that I could go on to be a prof uh, to that the ceiling was limitless for, for me. But I just decided with a heavy heart that I just couldn't carry on with the way the academy had basically been subverted by ideologues who were more okay. interested in pushing an agenda than the actual ancient past. Can I interject a question? Because I think this is like a super important point that I keep running into again and again. And I don't have the answer to it. To what extent do you think there has been this sea change that you're talking about? Because I'm sure you could go find old timers there that you could kind of, maybe you did, that you could pull aside and go, hey, kid, actually, it's always been like that. And here are the political games that I had to play and, you know, all the rest mm. of that stuff. And maybe it, it varies from uh, department to department. Maybe it varies from administration to administration. I don't know. I, I have kind of an intuitive sense from just what I've done here that there really is a change, but I don't want to, I want to fight that too. And I really want to challenge that. Do you know what I mean? Do you want to explore the whole, you know, because I'm sure you have, you, you probably question that too, don't you? No, absolutely. And tracing it back to the Frankfurter School, for instance, way back in the earlier 20th century, but it even goes further back than that that there were these machinations before then to become less and less about actual searching for not for knowledge about history, for instance, in my case, and more just to to instill an ideology, just a few points that they just keep on hammering into the students' minds, just the whole frame of the oppressor versus the oppressed narrative, as you know, in cultural Marxism. This so is so is it <clears throat> is it new is it same game different same playbook different play you know where now it's a different agenda being pushed forward or is there really something new in terms of the consolidation of control and power do you feel like you had the ability to go to another institution and have it be different or what are your what are your more your broader thoughts about that because you know what I mean, Nelson? I mean, we, we kind of get locked in, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to get locked into just kind of, you know, the diatribe. Oh, my God, we're oppressed, and this is the way it is. If that's the way it is, I want to talk about it. But I want to make sure we're kind of exploring the whole part of it. No, absolutely. I can understand that. And I think that people don't like these more nuanced processes of history, of the development of things. They just like a simple causation and a point where they can just mark. That's where it began, right? And I think it is what you said, it's cumulative, and that more and more of these faculties have just been taken over by the by these ideologues, basically. And the people who are genuinely searching after the knowledge of the ancient past, that they uh, slowly became, and often unwittingly, just pushed out. And even if they were brilliant researchers and teachers that they just ended up um, retiring. And then the new people who are coming in were just taking it over. And once you get the elite capture of a certain faculty and they start consciously putting in their fellow ideologues into the positions of authority, then it's very quick that the entire faculty just gets taken over. And tenure, for instance, is an illusion I've heard so many stories of, of, for instance, an entire faculty just being just being fired, basically. So everyone was let loose, and then they rehired only the ones that they wanted in. So that was that was a run around the institution of tenure. The other thing I've heard about tenure is the other game that they play is they're just changing the rules going forward. You know, because I've heard from people that have come on the show say. I have tenure, but I'm a dying breed. You know, they're just, and and to your point, when they hire people, they just hire them and that's part of their employment agreement. It's a non-tenure track, you know, or they'll, mm. 
they'll eliminate it. So they have a lot of little things. But if you think about it, tenure doesn't really serve the system that they it, it, you know, it, would you want tenure if you were running a department? Would you really want tenure if you were running a university? Would you really want tenure? And I think it kind of to me, it also relates to this whole thing about capitalism. And of course, capitalism run amok is a disaster. And that's why we have these rules. But it's almost like the reverse of that. Yeah, if I was running, if I was running a business, I'd want no restrictions, no controls. And the same thing, if I was running a university, I wouldn't want tenure because that is that is reduces my ability to control. And it's funny how people see this kind of left right. They don't see the shades of it's just people want total power to do what they want, whether they're in business or whether they're in academia. And our job is to put those controls and tenure was designed to be a control. You you probably should speak to that more because you, that was your that was your your life there for a while. Speak to the whole tenure mm -hmm. thing. I when I began, I, I just had this naive view that I could get into the academy, become a well known researcher just through the competency that I brought to it. But then. I just realized more and more that they just talking to professors that they weren't most of them that I encountered in different faculties that they were really only interested in basically just getting published that was the main thing for them actually so it was just this the selfish the selfish aim to just get publish or perish right you just uh, have to keep publishing and many of them were publishing dozens and dozens of articles but the readership on these is almost zero so you can even statistically see this that how often an article is cited of course and i think the average in the humanities is only one one citation i i you know one of the conversations i had a while ago i don't know if you remember it but was a virginia tech professor named dr henry bauer and he's an older guy and he's been around and he's really kind of seen a lot of things and he's kind of got interested in the HIV AIDS thing. And that was one of the things that I don't want to go too far into that, but very good science. And he also got interested in just people who's in academia, whose ideas were being suppressed. But what he pointed yeah. out from a big picture standpoint that I thought was really interesting and plays into what you're saying. He said, if you look at it from an economic model in the fifties, there was this huge increase in funding for all sorts of academic endeavors, whether it's in the humanities or the sciences or whatever, there was money. It just, and then, and then there was a move in the seventies to rein that in. And when you reduce the pool, well, the fish that were in there and were kind of swimming and, and getting along because there was plenty of food started having to attack each other. And, and that's what I think that competitive environment was utilized by maybe, and I'll get your opinion on this, became a tool and a vehicle for people who wanted to control the situation, control the message, whether it was a corporate entity trying to advance its drug, or whether it was someone who was trying to advance a certain idea, they saw an opportunity that, wow, now I have these guys jumping through all sorts of hoops for relatively nothing in terms of what I can give in terms of a grant or a citation or all the rest of that. What do you think about Bauer's analysis of that from an economic model? Well, I didn't actually see that interview. I've seen most of your interviews, but it just there's a fascinating point what you brought up because I just remembered straight away, as you said, that Clifford Geertz, he's a cultural anthropologist and very influential. He was maybe the most cited of any anthropologist in the last decades. He said explicitly that he got into the academy when it opened up during that time that you were mentioning that there was a, an explosion of positions in the university system. And that he got in at the right time during the way. And I th and he was really influential with just changing anthropology from something that you could empirically and sort of objectively analyze, that you could really have discussions about measurable facts to something that is 
postmodern that you just it's just an opinion and the meaning of words are just completely turned around and twisted and so you can't really even have a discussion about facts anymore in anthropology in cultural anthropology at least and this just reminds me that um looking at it from a conspiratorial angle that if you want to take over a faculty at a university you would open up the number of positions get your people in who are on your side and then once they're in like let's say you've got half of the faculty who are more just old school who are just interested in the material you open it up so that there are twice as many people but you're hiring the ones that you want and then you constrict it again like a funnel just constricting more and more and that's what's happening maybe that's quite brilliant i hadn't heard of that before but doesn't that make a lot of sense that's that's really quite interesting yeah so so nelson what what should we well, there's so many interesting things we could talk about again we've had this wonderful wonderful relationship it's so cool to talk to you for the first time but i i can't i, I say this all the time but you know, I feel connected to you just through the emails and the forum and over the years and this connection we have through the show. And it's, it is great to talk to you, but it, it doesn't feel even like it's the first time talking to you, even though it is. But in the, in recently we've had an email exchange that is really, I don't know, just taken blown my mind, as I said earlier. And there's a couple different parts of that, that we would might want to talk about where, where do you think we might start? What's on, what's on your agenda? Okay. First off, I have to give credit to Marty Gaza, who is a, an expert on the field of UFOs. And he did this amazing series on brothers of the certain podcast with whom you've had interviews before. And he did this series on UFOs. And I believe if I'm um, remembering correctly, that Marty was actually a, consultant at Fox News for one of their shows on UFOs that he was the expert that they had where people would call in about their sightings and Marty would then analyze the likelihood that that actually was a UFO and not just some natural phenomena or some sort of aircraft. And so if anyone wants to see this then in more detail then this uh, series with Marty on Brothers of the Serpent podcast so just to say that and this really just this series blew my mind and he comes from this study looking at ufo whereas i come from the perspective of academically studying and teaching mythology ancient religions and just the way that people fought back in the ancient world and so the two of us we were talking on the brothers of the serpent discord forum marty and i and we did have some disagreements with details, but just overall, it was amazing how much there is this continuum between the phenomena in the ancient world of the myths talking of these beings, which are far more powerful than humans, who shapeshift, who are capricious, who yeah, behave unpredictably, that they can implant thoughts into people's minds, abduct people at will, and who can breed with people. And then if we look at that as a general phenomena, just looking at that as a as a pattern, just as a as a meta analysis, we go then through folklore, and speaking of exactly the same thing, one of the greatest folklore researchers said that that's the main theme in folklore is basically hybridization between these entities and humans. And then we go on to the witch trials in the Middle Ages and coming into the early modern period where they're talking about the same things. This is a central theme. For instance, the Malleus Maleficarum, which is the main text of the witch trials, is the interbreeding between humans and these demons, as they call them, but they're basically these these paranormal entities and then if we go further into ufology going way back as well before roswell and everything but we're getting into into this as well that there are these beings who are coming down from the sky or somehow appearing from the earth 
they seem extremely telepathic they can shapeshift seemingly at will they're luminous and they can basically abduct people and breed with them and they're th obsessed with bloodlines and they're creating this progeny which is a hybridization of human and what i will call in this interview just ufo being just as in quotation marks because it's very difficult to define what these entities are whether they're gods or some sort of consciousness or some sort of material purely material being if we want to call it we're going to interweave this discussion back to the first part of the controlled message and we're talking about the controlled message in academia which seems to be lying behind that you know why are things moving in a certain direction why is the theme kind of relativism and what i always point out why does it go back philosophically to materialism you are meaningless you are a biological robot which is the underlying point i think in the humanities and they don't even realize it because they're not tuned into consciousness really being the fundamental question in science so they don't even notice when someone is steering them in in a direction that leads towards affirming this kind of scientific materialism but i think that's the game at hand and you're nodding your head so i think we'd agree but i i i think I don't, I don't want to get too far off the trail, but I, I can't resist throwing this just little sub point on the table is I almost feel like when we keep talking about UFOs and UAPs, there is a certain kind of conditioning psyop thing going on there because I can't believe the number of people I talk to and say, well, let's talk about ET. Let's talk about abduction. And there's they're, they're resistant to going there. And, and there's like mm. a pullback and it's like, well, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. I believe in UFOs. I believe, but I'm not willing to go there. And I'm like, okay, think that through for me and tell me how you're putting that together. You know, and, and if you're, if you're putting that together, you know, specifically in terms of saying, well, I think they're all drones operated, you know, then I, okay. But it just seems to me that that what's been planted into the system is this kind of block, this almost mental block that like, I will accept the evidence of the UFO UAP, but I won't even begin to go there with the ET because it leads to all the things you're talking about. It leads to abduction. It leads to genetic manipulation. It leads to what is our history? How far back does our history go? And of course, it leads to the extended consciousness realm. And what role are these beings, entities, whatever, playing in that in that game, in that extended field? But if I can roll that back, what do you think about that? That's kind of a crazy idea, I know. But do you think there's anything to that, Nelson? Have you noticed that? stop point, that gap, that speed bump that people have mentally between UFOs and each? I have, but I actually um, experienced the UFO myself as I communicated to you years ago. And I just assumed that it was a nuts and bolts sort of craft and that it was just simple. And just to very, very briefly describe this, this friend of mine from America, we were at a hostel in Australia. And he told me that he is in sort of a telepathic communication with UFOs. And that in this state where he lives in the U.S., I think it was New Mexico or Arizona, where, the, where it's really desert-like and clear skies. He said that above his house, every night there are these UFOs and that they're over, over the house. And that he and his two sort of housemates, that they had this telepathic communication with this light. And I asked him, how, well, to what extent is this? connection that you have with them and he said that he can tell when these lights are in the sky telepathically and that they're not hostile but more than that he he has no idea and so he was saying that this ufo had been following him around the whole world from america to australia when when we we're backpacking just that it was present sometimes and so one night we're on the balcony of the hostel and it was the evening, and he just said, 
I can sense that this UFO is here now. And we were looking in the sky, and we saw in, on the horizon towards the Blue Mountains, towards the interior of Australia, this light which looked like a star. And it started moving, and it was in a zigzag like this. And it was changing direction at a very sharp angle and not slowing down whatsoever. And at this time, I'd, I'd only just heard, heard very cursorily just what a UFO is supposed to be. And I just assumed that there would probably be some sort of craft up there, some flying saucer maybe that was making this light. And so I was just amazed and was telling people in the hostel and one of the people in the hostel there in Sydney, in the kitchen of the hostel, he said, no, you should be careful of these lights there prophesied in the book of revelations and that they're from the devil and he was very adamant about this and i just got a bit um concerned that if you tell people that they have all of these these ideas these preconceived ideas of what these things are and for myself i just believed it was nuts and bolts right and then i was talking to you years later and in the forum there was skeptical and i was just telling this other experience that I had of this um, reincarnation flashback, which I'll call it in quotation marks. And it was that at the hostel there in Australia in Sydney, it was in the evening and I was walking from the hostel to the beach about 50 meters away. And I was at the car park between the hostel and the beach. And then suddenly I could feel this energy in my body, this uh, energy flow got very strong going up and down from head to toe and then suddenly I couldn't move and I just stood there in the middle of the night there and no alcohol or drugs or anything like that I don't take drugs or anything just to make clear and, and so I was just standing there feeling this energy and couldn't move a muscle and then suddenly everything went blindingly white electric white sort of light and then slowly out of this whiteness, and I, could, I couldn't feel my body anymore, I couldn't sense time, I saw out of this whiteness, the scene before my eyes of this landscape, which somehow I knew was in the ancient past. And I was looking down on this river valley, which was arid the river valley, but by the river was this temple. And on the portico of the temple was this figure who was dressed in white clothes, had a bald head, shaved head, and I was looking down at him, and somehow I knew that this was a previous incarnation of an Egyptian priest, and that I was watching him as a past life experience. And I don't know how long I witnessed this for, but then the scene started to disappear, and the whiteness came back, this electric light, and then I could sense my body again, and the energy was just flowing up and down, shaking my body even, and I could slowly start to move again. And that was my reincarnation experience. And this would become more important as we discuss what this could have actually meant, because it's very existential and has your view, listeners will notice the similarities between what I just described and near-death experiences as well. But I told you about this reincarnation flashback on the forum. And then you said, and, and then you said to me that there is research that UFO experiences and near death experiences are often within a short period of each other. And I, that just blew my mind when I heard that because I thought straight away of this reincarnation flashback and how similar this is to a near death experience and that this flashback was within a few days of seeing the UFO at the hostel after this friend of mine had left Australia back to America, I was looking at the sky every evening. And within two days, I think it was of him leaving, I saw this, this star like light in the sky doing this again, this time on the other horizon towards the Pacific. And it was on the horizon moving in that characteristic shape. And then it suddenly just went down. And I don't know if it went over the horizon or into the sea. But, yeah, that was what happened, basically. And, and the reincarnation flashback was within this week to 10 long, a 10 day long period. So it's extremely unlikely that that was a coincidence, I feel. 
Yeah, there does seem to be something to the opening up to this extended realm. And I'm always hesitant to go too far there because fundamentally, we don't understand consciousness. And that's been my, that's been my gig, my soapbox for 10 years is until we can admit, okay, we don't understand it. We don't really know how to process a lot of this stuff. And I, I just continue to, to continue to go there. I mean, the fundamental question is, is consciousness fundamental? Mm. <laughs> because if consciousness is fundamental and all is emerging out of consciousness, well, then it's a different game. And, and that is the, essentially when we go to the spiritual, that's what the, the spiritual wisdom traditions, especially the ones that I'm been most tuned into the yogic ones. I mean, that's what they've always said is that, it's all an illusion. It's all Maya. So it's all a play. And there does seem to be a certain truth to that. And But that would, that would cause us to look at all of this stuff differently, all of this completely differently, you know? And I think we don't really want to go there right away, at least. We want to sit here and try and figure it out. But I always want to kind of bracket the discussion of figuring it out with this idea that at some fundamental level, we don't really understand. We don't understand what past life memories are. And I think, mm. like if I just throw my two cents in, one of the misunderstandings that I think a lot of people leap to is if you, if you listen to Jim Tucker from the University of Virginia, and you watch the cases that he's reviewed, or you read about the cases, and you read the peer-reviewed journals, and you look at the science behind it, you know, the correlation between violent death and birthmarks. I mean, gosh, you can't get, I mean, that's, uh, that's pretty hard to, hard to walk away from. And if you just look at the number of cases they get that are vile, that, that have a reincarnation memory associated with it and have a violent death associated with it compared to the general population. Well, that jumps out too as a statistical anomaly. And then of course, that's, that's a folk tradition in India as well. I uh, learned meditation in India and just spent time in the countryside and talked with the people. And this is a folk belief of exactly what you say. So the science and the folk tradition is showing the same thing again. So it seems very unlikely that that would be coincident. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad I'm glad you threw that in there. So and, and can I go back, I just wanted to go back to your question originally about the psyop angle. And if there is a psyop that the UFO phenomena is just being narrated as nuts and bolts, right? And I believe that there is that just if you look at the pattern, they just want the simple narrative that is just reductive, materialistic, that it's a threat. Maybe they can create the problem, reaction, solution. They can create this one world government through this of global threat, therefore a global solution, being a cons on a conspiratorial angle. But you see even this with, with Valet, for instance, as the well, consultant. Hold, hold on, before we, before we jump into Valet, which is a whole other thing, I want to comment on what you just said, because... When you were telling me about your story, the one thing that flashed to me, which is, is another crazy angle. And when you first started talking, you said, you know, we're going to have to be willing to go to that next level. I always call it level three inside baseball where we may lose some people, but that's okay. You know, we just, oh, no, no, it's no problem. <laughs> we just have to go where it takes us. But Nelson, yes. what I thought about is that when, when you were talking about seeing the uh, UFO and thinking that it's nuts and bolts, the first thought I would is, like, oh my God, this sounds like so many of the screen memory things that you hear from UFO, from ET abductees, right? You'll, you'll hear about this over and over again. You know, I just interviewed a guy named Ralph Blumenthal, who's a New York Times reporter, and maybe we'll come back to him. But he wrote a terrific biography on John Mack. And John Mack was, a, of course, the Harvard professor who got interested in people who had these abduction experiences. And he said, wow, I'm, a, I'm one of the world's leading psychiatrists. I know when people are making stuff up. 
These people are not making this stuff up. Part of that experience is this screen memory. You are okay. You have, and it's often very simple kind of ideas that, that are almost like, you know, nursery school level rhymes kind of thing. But what, what it, it, I just had an in, instant connection with what you were talking about. There's nothing to worry about. This is just a nuts and bolts machine. You know, it's like, it's such an oversimplified ex explanation for what you're experiencing that it did pop to mind that it could potentially be a screen memory. And that doesn't preclude it from being all those other things that you're saying too. It would just suggest that there maybe is some cooperation between whoever is implanting some of those screen memories and your idea, which I think is, is, is my conclusion too, is that of course you want people to think that it is a nuts and bolts. Of course you want people to think in, down a materialistic science standpoint because you hit the, the nail on the head, I think. Then it becomes a military threat. Then it becomes the impetus for us to further control and use our standard playbook of military industrial complex. We're going to protect you kind of thing. It all fits together. Before we jump on, I have like five other topics that you've already kind of brought up that I want to get back to, including the past lives memory thing. But it, did I, did I kind of get that right? And I kind of took it one step further with perhaps E.T. is part of that planting that screen memory of don't worry. It's just it's just an object. It's just nuts and bolts. It's just a machine in the sky. So how would you define screen memory, by the way? Well, screen memory isn't so much my term. It's just a, a common term among abductees that they feel like and and it's also a, a term that is used for people who have trauma dissociative identity kind of thing of where it, it's like in hypnosis where there's a block you know as soon as you start thinking about something you're just blocked from going any further so the screen yeah. me the screen memory among the abduction community and i don't want to overstate it because i'm certainly not an expert is implanted memory that when they examine it further seems inconsistent with what they would normally, how they would normally process the situation. You know what I mean? So it, it just stands out as kind of an unusual implanted memory that doesn't exactly fit the scenario. You know, why are my clothes? Why am I wearing someone else's clothes? You know, it's like, well, there's an explanation for it. There's an explanation for everything that pops into mind that rationally doesn't make any sense. We always come back to the existential question then with UFOs of consciousness, the nature of consciousness. And it reminds me so much of NDEs as well. And we'll get to this in a second, I think, or later on, that there's this seemingly absurd or irrational bizarreness even of, of this phenomenon that is difficult to really just make sense of. And this is one of the reasons why I started to question what these NDEs actually could be. And I, do you want me to get into that now, actually? What, maybe um, maybe let's, what, pause, let's pause on that for a second, because I kind of wanted to finish a point that I was, I, I, maybe I was not getting there fast enough, but with the past life memories, the one problem I see with that is like, like I was saying, you know, you can go down the Jim Tucker path and the science that the University of Virginia has compiled on that and you walk away and you go, wow. And, and the, the one thing that strikes you is the big lie, you know, wow, how can science ignore this? This is overwhelming data that's replicated over and over again. And Jim Tucker is doing the right thing. He just says, I'm just compiling more and more and more data, more casework, doing it as carefully as I can. And you can appreciate this from your academic background is I'm just going to pile it up and I'm going to stack the corded wood with uh, cases from the North America as well, because there's a certain amount of dismissing this because they're from India or Sri Lanka. But the, the problem with that is that then I think a lot of people take the next step and I am unwilling to take that next step. The next step is to suggest that there, it is literally true 
that you are literally, literally remembering a past life and that yeah. you can understand that in the context of your life. And if you really step back and look at that, and that's why I guess I would relate that back to your story of the your past life or memory or what you suspect is a past life memory of the ancient that's Egypt. Quotation marks as well. That's why I did put it in quotation marks as a I, reincarnation. I sense that you have that sensibility, which I think is great. And I, I, I mean, I guess this is kind of even more of a philosophical question, but you're of that mindset to, to be the right guy to talk about this, is that that is a recurring theme in this in terms of how do we move forward? How do we use that that data, that new data that is trying to be uh, uh, suppressed and trying to be denied, but then how do we not overstep with it? Because, and, and you understand the implications of what I'm, or you understand where I'm going with that, is that past life memories do not only make sense in linear time. And yet they're talking about escaping time and space to have those memories. So there's, an, there's already an internal contradiction that no one talks about. How can you yes. have a past life memory? What does that mean? Why do you think your life is primary? Are you living multiple lives at the same time? You know, which life is primary, is fundamental? All these questions kind of just get pushed aside and say, well, well, no, can you take me back to a time when I had this past life memory without really mm -hmm. thinking it through? And that I think is our challenge in terms of pushing this consciousness frontier is to just kind of point out these obvious uh, problems. Do you have any... Do you have any thoughts on that? My thoughts on this are that there are a number of angles that we've been taking, right? The actual investigators, such as the University of Virginia professor with the with the reincarnation stories that he's been compiling, and Dr. Long, for instance, and others, Pintham Long, with the near-death experiences, and they're really the investigators who are compiling the data, and they're specialists in their field and highly qualified in that field. But then there is the the analysis of the data and looking at different data sets as well. For instance, what you've been doing on your show is looking at all these different fields, which originally seem to be disconnected. Like when you started talking about UFOs, I was really just, I found that just quizzical, really. I didn't really understand where you were going with that. And some of your audience also were wondering what you were doing with this. But then we look at the similarities just the overall patterns between these different fields and we'll put that in quotation marks as well so these different data sets and we've got near-death experiences for instance we've got reincarnation memories and we've got ufology and i just and we've got mythology as well and so if we've got all of these different fields of study and folklore as well so many of them if we look at it as a very very broad pattern we're seeing very very similar phenomena for instance this sensation of timelessness that these uh, experiences have that time becomes meaningless that that space all, also becomes meaningless just with a thought this ufo seems to just what the abductees are recalling is that they're then there at that place and that there's this dislocality with this whole pattern and this is what i think is necessary for the few people in the world who have enough knowledge with these different data sets who have been trained as well to analyze data that we can just see these overall patterns and not be uh, distracted by the smaller details and we can just see the overall pattern for instance of what you were describing of timelessness and spacelessness within all of these data sets but it's tough, isn't it? And I'd go back to your background. I thought it was so interesting. You said, you know, you were studying these Greek vases, right? Like, and you were probably one of the top experts in the world at that, I imagine, just from what you're telling me. Not that you're the top, but one of the top. And so there is someone out there. Is someone out there. What's that? Compared to the general population. So there's someone out there on the site doing the archaeological dig, sifting through that stuff that's bringing back to you the little pieces. And then you're compiling those little pieces. And then there's someone else who's analyzing it, as you said. Well, great, Nelson. That's great. And you've put it together and you've put it. And, and, 
And just to be clear, I've always been more of an analyst, not an investigator. So I specialize in the the analysis, not the actual excavation. It's not archaeology. So I'm looking at it as more of a meta-analysis of all these different religions, these ancient religions and the ancient cultures and how they thought, and really immersing myself in that and seeing the overall patterns of this and to figure out how they thought and how the material culture was. Awesome. Totally awesome. And I kind of assumed so. And I just was wondering if you wanted to take what you just said and take that even further, right? Because as you described at the very beginning of this show, then your mind, when you learned about some folklore and mythology that you weren't familiar with, you immediately expanded your paradigm, which was already kind of there, you know, and I think that's what's constantly, constantly going on. And as you point out, what it's going to take is then merging that paradigm with about four other paradigms to nudge even closer to it. And when you look at it from that perspective, I don't know, it's a big job. Yeah, and we've got to be careful with all of this, that when we're seeing the patterns, which are actually very repetitive and they're very significant, I think, but we still have to be skeptical that just because there is a correlation with all these data sets, that it is actually a causation. Because maybe it isn't the same exact mechanism that's behind every single one. But I still think it's significant that we still see this pattern, for instance, of timelessness and non-locality within all of this, within mythology, folklore, within ufology, within near-death experience, science, and within studies as well. So great. And I want to jump right back into the mythology thing, because it's really kind of a hot bud issue for me. But I can't resist before we go there. Do you have any examples from your personal experience as a researcher where this correlation versus causation thing did crop up. I always think of the cave paintings and the initial thing is, oh, that's pornography, you know, and that it's like, they, they dig around, they go, well, no, it's not at all. You know, it's like, did, did anything like that in, in the work that you did where there was kind of this, if, if not you, someone else who had to do a major kind of, oops. Just basically what I would say is that most of the people in academia now who are being paid to work. They are extremely condescending of the ancient cultures, and they are actually rewarded for explicitly describing these religions as superstition, explicitly. And this is such a huge prejudice that you're just assuming that it's nonsensical, just fantastical, ridiculous ideas that these people had. And I've seen this. I've seen people Actually, one person in particular that I'm thinking of, he was rewarded, given a prize for an essay competition, a national essay competition in New Zealand, for writing that the ancient religions were superstition. So interesting. That's such a great point, because it fits perfectly this about this other thing we're talking about, which has been kind of my gig for a long time, is the main message being propagated is you are meaningless and you do not, consciousness is an illusion. And it, it's so funny that people in the humanities don't understand that, but that would be the natural extension of that. And it's also funny, like we're talking about that, like I look at the reincarnation research at Jim Tucker, and I guess this is what I was kind of alluding to is like, you know, great reincarnation, how about just using that just to completely break down this scientific materialism dogma and its implications for consciousness? Because this, to me, relates directly back to your point. If there is this extended realm, if uh, reincarnation is, in fact, the evidence for that is is strong, then that guy no longer looks credible. Not that he ever did look credible, but it... I guess what I'm saying is, doesn't a lot of the stuff we're talking about, including reincarnation, science, including near-death experience, science, do you think that, that part of the pushback on that is that it fundamentally undermines that guy you're talking about in a way that probably he doesn't even realize? And that, you know, maybe that's really the game that's afoot without a lot of people knowing it with inside of academia. 
it's always difficult to analyze what people are actually motivated by, what their inner life is. So I don't really want to comment too much on that. But I think a lot of it probably is unconscious with many of these individuals that they're so seeped in this worldview of reductionist materialism and this meaningless universe and that it's just ridiculous superstition what the ancients were doing that they really probably haven't even heard an alternative view of this that like i i, I just come at the whole past with this open mind that maybe what the ancients were describing was literally true or at least a kernel of truth of what they were experiencing that's a radical idea but what if what they're describing in the religions and in communication with these entities which they were obsessively trying to do to get real world effects maybe they were actually con connecting with some entities or maybe these myths that they're describing actually are some entities which are visiting humans and that it's not just nonsense that's the question that I have. I'm open to this. Whereas Absolutely. most most academics are just completely closed. Right. And at this point, it's almost like we need to leave academia behind and scientific materialism behind because if it is an operation, as we both kind of suspect, if it is a PSYOP, if it is a conspiracy, then to kind of constantly refer back to it is almost serving its purpose to a certain extent. So if we kind of lose that rocket and or what are they called, that stage of the rocket and leave that behind and kind of zoom forward, I want to get right to your point because right when you said it from the beginning, this is kind of a skeptical moment. I'm uncomfortable with where a lot of people are taking the mythology, folklore, Jacques Vallée kind of stuff, because Jacques Vallée, of course, was the first one to, or the, I don't know if he was the first one, but is it, I think he was. I think he was the first one to really draw this. You think? Yeah, I think he was definitely the most influential. Yes, good way of putting it. Certainly the most influential and definitely one of the first people to draw this connection between folklore, fairies, other uh, mythical beings, and their striking similarity to what people are reporting as the UFO experience and the ET experience, the abduction experience, the contact experience, all those things. What I also point out is that, you know, Jacques Vallée, I interviewed him, he also walks around with a little bit of uh, slag in his pocket from the UFO that he, that the ship that he has, where it's a physical thing, and he's put it under the microscope and said, hey, we don't know how to build this material. We don't know how to manufacture this material. We don't know how to fuse these metals together from a technology standpoint. So he is standing with one foot in one world and one foot in the other world. And that's where I think we all have to stand on this. And it returns to my thing about reincarnation. If we fundamentally don't understand consciousness, then we have to be really careful about where we go with extended consciousness. And I'll just tie a couple of threads back in without really winding them too tight because we can't. I think the genetic engineering component of this is central, and I'm glad you brought it up from the beginning. I think the work of uh, Bruce Fenton, have you heard? Do you know who Bruce Fenton is? I think his work is absolutely uh, critical to understanding this and for also also for reestablishing a potential timeline. His timeline is 800,000 years. Okay, so what if we can show some evidence of genetic manipulation for the last 800,000 years for an ongoing process of genetic manipulation? It changes the whole thing so dramatically, and we're less focused on our little world and our little slice of time that that it, it is being manipulated and shaped and at the and, and injected into. What do you think about all that? Well, even the concept of time, our perception of it is so limited, it seems. Whereas these beings seem to be in this far more expensive reality of time. And you see this in mythology as well of the gods that they're in this timeless realm and for them just the blink of an eye is many human lifetimes and that they can 
punish humans, for instance. They can do terrible things en masse to humans, causing global catastrophes generations after they've been insulted by an individual. And this is explicitly talked about in the Greek myths as well of Hesiod, one of the most fundamental sources of Greek mythology along with Homer. He explicitly states this, that, that the gods have a different timeline than humans. Right. And and I you know, we keep we keep hitting on a lot of the a lot of the same things. Where else do we want to go? I tell you where I want to go. I, I, I want to see if we can get some degree of closure with the UFO ET thing by bringing it back to what we're experiencing right now and what we're seeing right now, particularly as it relates to the control and the global control and the message and how the message is being shaped. It is stunning to me that people even entertain really intelligent people really entertain this idea of disclosure as if as if it's a current event that happened when the New York Times released these videos from 10 years ago as if that is somehow disclosure. I mean, even in our memory, in our living memory, we have to scratch our heads and go, well, well, wait a minute. What about all those other cases? What about uh, Roswell? What about, you know, all these cases? What about the flap in DC? All these, I could go on and on, but you get the point. So I want to go there and I want to talk about that and bring the UFO ET thing up to the present. But I want to make sure we leave some time to talk about the Romans, because as I maybe mentioned to you, I don't know if it was before or after we started recording, you have quite an amazing insight, my little foray into that stuff that, that kind of blew my mind. So we'll start with what's going on today with UFO disclosure. So I basically agree with Marty Gaza from the Brothers of the Serpent podcast that the disclosure is so limited. And actually, just from my perspective, just reading that document, the unclassified version was just so insulting the language just as if the audience are idiots, just hardly saying anything, basically nothing sandwich, right? Uh, now, now yeah, when you say that, do, remind people, no. remind people what you're, what you're referring to there, the document was, that you're it, referring to. This was in June of this year, 2021, of the duty of the US government to release the information that was held on UFOs, if I understand that correctly. And, Right. And what a lot of people point out, and rightfully should be, but a lot of people don't make the connection is, so this was introduced by Donald Trump in a bill that was tied to, you know, it was buried in a bill that the government should have to release all information within 180 days. And the whole thing was absurd from the beginning. And it, it, it kind of is disappointing to me the extent to which uh, our, our community, this broader community, falls into the same game. It's like we're watching the, the the sports channel, you know, either in Europe or in the American. The sports channel is a sports channel everywhere in the world. It's like, hey, what are we going to talk about today? And well, let's talk about it and talk about it and talk about the same thing over and over again. And there's no information. They don't even have to program people to do that. They just move the cheese a little bit and people follow that. How could it be any more absurd? Why would anyone in the world think that they would release anything after 180 days? They haven't released anything in 60, 70 years or however long they've known about it. Why would they feel compelled to release anything in 180 days? And I, again, I go back to the disclosure thing because I interviewed both Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal, who were the two, had the byline on the New York Times big disclosure thing in December of uh, 2017, 2018. I can't remember now. Dates are flipping out of my head. But the idea that that forget about everything else, forget about how we've threatened to kill people, forget about how we've said we will take your family out in the desert and and bury them alive if you ever disclose any of the things that you've seen. Forget all mm -hmm. about that. Disclosure will now be this video that we just released. And we'll have a bunch of talk about who was the guy piloting the ship and what do they know here? It is such an obvious, obvious kind of a 
ploy, the trick, not even, it's not even that sophisticated. Because it's, the timeline is so restricted that it's just going a tiny bit back into the past. And the number of cases that are unexplained is also so limited. Whereas even on 60 Minutes, there were pilots saying uh, that they are over the carrier fleets, they're seeing the UFOs on, almost on a daily basis for years. What does this say about the extent of the control of the message and the extent to which the population is easily manipulated by a controlled message? To me, it's it's it, it doesn't leave a lot of, a lot of hope. I mean, this is stuff that I think anyone should be able to kind of figure out pretty pretty easily. And I'm surprised. I mean, you I'm not even want to mention names because they're people I really like, but the people I've had on the I, I can just tell you, I almost ignore this then, just with this government disclosure business, because it's just so obvious that they're just creating this tiny frame with which to understand the phenomenon. But Nelson, the question it's I'm important. asking is, why do so many people in our community, the leaders in our community, buy into this? And it's not even that they're buying into it. They just seem to be compelled to talk about this talking point of disclosure, rather than going, this is obviously a PSYOP. We don't know who exactly is behind the PSYOP. We don't know the the, the entire method, but completely political PSYOP. And, you know, you can go look at the shows that I've done where the leading people are going, eh, no, I don't, I don't think so. You know, Lou Elizondo, even though he's a lifetime spy, disinformation agent, I think he's telling the truth this time. I'm like, well, what have we learned? What have we learned, you know, in all this stuff that we've investigated? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I just just tend to look at the overall patterns way, way back into history and um, just going beyond this frame, not giving even this official disclosure much attention, really, because it's so irrelevant. It's only really relevant in terms of being a PSYOP, but it's not actually that relevant as part of the data set itself, right? So this is what I wanted to sort of draw back on, is that even though it's disappointing, right, the, the disclosure was going to be disappointing anyway for most people, but it's disappointing the reaction of many investigators as well. But I think if we go beyond that and just focus on the the data that we've got from all these different fields that your show has covered over the years, and I think this is extremely significant that we have so many similarities and core uh, characteristics of, as we we're saying, in mythology and folklore, and in even in even in ufology and in near death experiences and in reincarnation studies. And the chance that that would be a coincidence, I find just extremely unlikely. For instance, even in near-death experiences, if you go on the database and look up aliens or ET or something, you'll actually see even that, that these entities seem to be appearing, well, reportedly anyway, in near-death experiences. See, the problem I have with that, Nelson, is most people, including myself at times, have problems resolving the data set of the current disclosure, the UFOs, the obvious, you know, our best pilots, our best observers reporting them in the sky, the videos of them in the sky, the accounts of people who have a hard time resolving that with folklore mythology as we understand it. And I'd say, you know, like I have, I have a hard time talking to people if I don't want to talk about COVID. And I, I, I don't mind talking about COVID. I talked to him the yeah, other day. He's a major broadcaster in Canada. And, you know, I, and he, I wanted to talk to him about the bigger spiritual questions of evil. Is there evil behind some of these people who we see are running this program? He could not get there. And I understand why. He has his kids that he's sending to school that are encountering a mobile vaccination. Now, I don't care what anyone thinks about vaccination pro or con. He, what he doesn't like is they have a mobile vaccination station and his kids are minors 
and they're said, hey, it doesn't matter if you're a minor, it doesn't matter if your parents are consenting, you can come on in here and you can decide yourself, you know, and it's against the law and all the rest of this. And he is like consumed with this because he's a parent and he lives in Canada and it's just a trampling of laws and rights and stuff like that. This is where people are at. And I think there's a corollary to where people are at with UFOs. And the corollary is, well, are they... Are they a threat? What's going on? What is going to happen in my lifetime? Is ET going to take over in my lifetime? And I think when we hit people with the folklore mythology data set, which is very real, as you point out, it is somewhat irresolvable. You know, you cannot resolve. I agree with that. I just don't think it is irresolvable. It's just the perception that it seems so complicated that it wouldn't be resolvable. But even, for instance, as Joe Atwell showed, well, had this incredibly paradoxical-seeming data set of the New Testament, and then just as one researcher just had this brilliant insight that Josephus was the template for the New Testament. And researchers before him, I studied the New Testament as well myself, and they, this was the typical attitude before Atwell, was that it's irresolvable, the New Testament. Who wrote it? For what reasons? Why are there these contradictions? And uh, it's so ancient that uh, we'll never know. But I just disagree with that. I think it, you can have insights and you can see patterns, like Atwell did, for instance, absolutely classic, just in terms of analysis, that he could find a pattern and he could so firmly establish causation as far as you possibly could, I think, as a researcher of antiquity. And now even more and more of the mainstream, even in academia, they're just going with it. They're not really giving him credit, but they're they're agreeing with him. So I think we can come to resolve analyses with these things. I love it. I love it. So let me push that a little bit further. Let's try and connect a couple of these data sets. I'll expand your your phrase there. Take the Bruce Fenton data set, which I think is very important in my mind, because he has some really good science behind that. He has the astral tectites and the dating of those. He has a bunch of other stuff, including genetics, genetics very, very powerful stuff. So from that falls out a couple other th- a couple of things. One calls falls out is a clear pat a, a clear pattern of genetic manipulation, and the other is a timeline that now t- extends back to eight hundred thousand years. But the other thing that fall that falls out of that that a lot of people don't immediately grab onto is a very kind of a a, a faction divided ET and maybe species divided ET that we can certainly identify with, you know, hey, this is my planet. No, this is my planet. Oh, well, I'm going to shoot at you. You're going to shoot at me. I'm going to win. You're going to lose. It sounds very familiar. It sounds very familiar. So, you know, back to my point of irresolvable. So if we take those and run with it, run with 800,000 years of genetic manipulation ongoing genetic manipulation, which is consistently reported by abductees, is it's all about genetics. It's all about this. Here's where it doesn't resolve for me. When I hear people talk about uh, mythology, they'll say, like you said a, a, a while back, they seem to be obsessed with bloodlines. No, I look at Bruce Fent and say, Dude, they are so fucking far past bloodlines. They're doing genetic splicing in a million different ways and creating all these different in their garden. They're creating all these different varieties and they're paring them down and they're doing all this stuff. The idea Mm. of a literal bloodline and that, you know, it, it, it just is. It's it's a very it's it's a reading of the folklore in mythology that doesn't get us closer. In that way, it can't really be resolved. It can only be resolved when we say, "Oh, perhaps that's a metaphorical connection to what Bruce Fenton is saying." But we should never dare take that literally. That you know they're worried about who they're fucking so that they get the the right offspring kind of thing. Yeah, that's a huge can of worms, right? Because was it just the ancients describing a 
laboratory style genetic manipulation using language such as bloodlines and breeding into breeding or was it more the laboratory sterile objective scientific manipulation of the genetics but just taking the ancients literally the gods in quotation marks were lustful sexually aroused by human individuals and mated with them right and actually this is what uh ballet passport tonight um begonia actually in that classic uh focuses on the continuum of folklore to ufology he doesn't actually go back into mythology but he does make the connections between between sorry folklore the witch trials and ufology and i actually just wrote this quote as well because it's so important that quote considerable problems arose however when one had to identify the physical process of intercourse with demons this is clearly a most difficult point and then he writes in brackets as difficult as that of identifying the physical nature of flying saucers who wrote that and, and, and that was valet that was valet's quote and he was referring to the, the um theologians in the middle ages who were wrestling with the the implications that there seemed to be these entities these demons who were interbreeding with humans especially human females and creating offspring even and how is this even possible is this some sort of physical process some sort of bloodline compatibility and when we use the word bloodlines and all the it's more of an old style of language right they didn't have that vocabulary to describe this but just looking at it on its surface i still think we have to be to be true to what the ancient and the medieval sources were saying it that there is this lust it seems to be there seems to be a lust of these entities like sexual desire of these entities for mating with humans so it's not just some sterile laboratory thing so i I'd, I'd go a couple of different directions with that one that level of i don't know what to even call it but but that to me that resonates with this extended consciousness realm that we're talking about those level of emotions are to me seem most to most fit with the angels and the demons and the extended consciousness realm that filters through us so i immediately want to pivot on that and say hey what do we really know? What do we really know of as lust and and lust being this very human emotion, but in so many ways, it seems to transcend our humanness. And that's both the allure of it. And it's also the destructive element of it. And that's been recorded forever. So when we talk about ET with that, I go back to my question, what does ET's near death experience look like? What does ET's past life? What does ET's life review look like? To me, that gets us closer than reading the Sumerian tablets or reading the Anunnaki, you know, who say, what I was just hearing some of the other days, an expert in the Anunnaki say, yeah, you know, we tried the genetic, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, we tried the genetic engineering in a clay pot, but that didn't work so good. So then they had to shift to, you know, and you read this stuff and you go, Fuck, man. I mean, if they had genetic engineering down to that, I don't think they tried it with a clay pot. I think they realized that might not work so well. So that's why I mean where it's irresolvable. And that's where we get into this whole other layer of false research. or I don't want to call it disinformation, but Sitchin, for instance. Sitchin's the one who translated the Sumerian texts, for anyone who doesn't know. And it's it's just been very much criticized, his translations of certain words, and that it's very much just leading into his pet theory of this. And I just, I don't want to go there too much because that's not my field. But, I but just we, we, would, we would have to interject like, that over time, some of, some of Zachariah Sitchin's speculations have proven to be much more accurate than the original academic interpretations of it. So we're in this no man's land that we, we kind of I, return to of like, yeah, yeah did he take it too far and did he misquote it? Yes, but was he on somehow the right track in some way? We don't know, right? But yeah, because just from my perspective, just looking at it as academically as possible, I would just use the standard trans uh, academic translations of these texts, like the Enuma Elisha and these other 
like the Gilgamesh app, Epic, and all of these different ones, and just use the standard academic translations, which are accepted by everyone. And you don't even need some specific uh, special translations of words to just see just this overwhelming pattern of, of interbreeding between gods and humans. And this is in, in different continents, even going right into the folklore of the American Indian, Adi Six Killer Clarks, the professor of um, anthropology, right? And her reports of these that Native Star Americans Star people. Are, Star oh, people is what the... And, and uh, several books as well now. And it's just remarkable, the continuum throughout time, and even of beings that we would have encountered in mythology of these serpentine beings, even what David Icke has been passing on, which he was just absolutely made a laughing stock of in the mainstream. But what is this as a, of a coincidence that you've got people, these traditional people on the other side of the world in America, who have this relatively unbroken tradition of folklore, and they're even experiencing these serpentine, seemingly interdimensional, metamorphizing beings that are serpentine and they seem hostile to humans and just as a researcher who's open-minded you just you just have to take these seriously you just can't just pass them off as nonsense hey that's just, a that's a super great point and i think you i think you did i think you you won that one in terms of that's a very direct here and now example of where we are forced to resolve that we are forced which is your point we do have to kind of and that's what i think you're advocating hey that has to be part of your paradigm in a here now kind of world because as you point out if we go to the native american tradition some of those encounters are not that they're more or less present day kind of thing or within a couple of generations yeah, yeah like her latest book I think it's the latest book, the one on uh, different seeming species of uh, UFO beings. And one of the sections on this is on these reptilian sort of entities, which are shapeshifters. And she's getting these reports, apparently, from veterans from uh, Vietnam and from more recent uh, reports as well. So it's very uh, recent, all of her accounts. And I just find her relatively trustworthy source. I mean, professor of, or retired now, but professor of anthropology, and she seems to have good protocols for the collection of data and not seeming to have leading questions. Unlike, for instance, what I saw from, for instance, the Betty and Barney Hill case way back in the 50s of the hypnosis that was done, and there's the audio of this, which is available on YouTube, that you can actually hear the original recordings. And this hypnotist is asking extremely leading questions and is filling in even what the meaning of certain things are. So I was just very impressed with Adi Six Killer Clark book, for instance, on on these different seeming species of UFO beings, if we can call them that in quotation marks. And this is very strange, right? That there would seem to be these species, these factions, which are fighting against each other, and that they're actually in their encounters with humans, explicitly telling the humans that there are these factions of these beings and that they're fighting against each other, and that some are extremely hostile to humans, these reptilians, and the which are also shapeshifters as well, to at least some degree. And these other species, if we can call them this, of these UFO beings, which seem to be more friendly towards humans and even protecting humans from from disease, and curing people and taking them away from war zones, for instance. And I just see this pattern over and over again of factions or species of these UFO beings, which are in conflict with each other and humans seem to be in the middle of this and quite unwitting and even quite minor players in the whole cosmos. And this is actually exactly what we see in mythology, that humans are actually very minor in the scale of the cosmos and 
the different species, if we can call them that, that of these gods in conflict with each other. For instance, in the in Greek mythology, it's between the the Olympians and the Titans, and there's this great struggle between Zeus, for instance, the king of the Olympians, the leader of the Olympians, and Prometheus, the Titan, who is aiding humans, it seems, giving them technology, giving humans technology. And Zeus being so so angry at this that he tortured Prometheus in perpetuity. And then you've got in this fra a fragment of Hesiod, who is one of the most important sources in mythology, uh, it explicitly detailing how Zeus decided that there was too much interbreeding between the demigods and the gods, and that this was becoming a danger to the purity of the bloodline of the gods, and that he he was going to wipe out the demigods, whether these bloodlines are, if we can call them bloodlines. So it's, it's very much a pattern, again, that we see in ufology, these factions were fighting amongst themselves, and humans seem to be in the middle of this, and just small players. And then you've got mythology basically saying the same thing. Hey, hey, let me let me jump in there. That is that is wonderful, and I see where now I see more clearly where you've been going all along. And I I, I just here would be my my pushback. The the interesting part of the discussion we can have to me it seems like a one it seems like a why evil matters kind of question. It also seems like an as below so above kind of question in terms of we see the same thing within ourselves and within our culture. People who are deemed as less worthy, less valuable, and we've done this throughout our, our recorded history. You know, these people can be ignored. These people can be butchered, killed in all sorts of ways, enslaved, all these things. So this idea of there being this hierarchy that we impose that is beyond any kind of moral imperative of some ultimate highest form of the consciousness is, is always that question. And maybe I'm not being direct enough. So the point I would make is, do we think consciousness is hierarchical? Are we willing to speculate that there is a hierarchy and that hierarchy would point to something that we would identify as God? And I think that most of our wisdom traditions would tell us, and along with the science that I see, like the near-death experience science is telling us, that the Prometheus is a head fake. The reptilian alien is a head fake in the sense of if you think that's God, you've kind of missed the point. The point is they're going to have a life review too, and they have a soul, and their soul is on some kind of journey that we can't understand. And this is why I'm even reluctant to go there because we can't really talk about this stuff in any meaningful way. But at the same time, I think if we don't well, I talk— think, I think that's a limiting belief. I think we can. We just need to look at the data. And if we look at near-death experiences, it's undeniable that there, there's a hierarchy of souls shown, shown there, all the way up to what you could call God. And we see this in the mythology as well. They're talking about hierarchies. It's extremely hierarchical. So we just look at the data, and the data shows overwhelmingly that it's not egalitarian. There are, there are hierarchies and in these uh, wisdom traditions, in these extremely internal meditative traditions in uh, Tibet and in India, we're seeing exactly the same thing as well. Let me just interject here because I want to get your thought on this. The way I read that from a lot of the Indian tradition and the non-dual tradition is that what we're, what we're really looking at is confusion, is a misunderstanding, is a less than full learning, and that if we did look at it more broadly, and I'm just throwing this out as a hypothesis, is that that kind of hierarchy is attuned to our consciousness down here, but that the ultimate reality is that we're all just bubbles in the ocean. And there's a lot of bubbles in the ocean. And every time a wave hits, there's a bunch of new bubbles. Don't get too hung up on your bubble. And don't get too, uh, in Prometheus, man, that's a big bubble. But it's just a fucking bubble. That would be the non-dual philosophy that we're all kind of back to that. Sorry to interrupt, but this is the biggest debate in Indian philosophy, right? In Vedanta, of dualism versus non-dualism and qualified non-dualism. So you've got these mixtures of of 
viewpoints, right? But I, I just think, look at the data, right? And the data is showing that there are hierarchies. So I, I just think you've got to somehow get around that. You could say that, the, that there's something beyond it, but to just deny that there is hierarchy within the NDE experiences would just be to just falsify things, right? I just want to be clear about that. Then let's agree on that and see where that takes us. Because sometimes what I hear uh, you saying, and I hear this in the in the mythology, folklore, you know, shape-shifting alien kind of thing, is an assumption that that hierarchy is different than I would assume it to be. So when I look at Ted Bundy, and I look at somebody who I think was being influenced by beings in the extended consciousness realm, I'm not sure where to put Ted Bundy in that hierarchy. When I look at the people who are behind some of these global control mechanisms that seem to be imposed on us, when I look at, you know, the why evil matters, the Annika Lucas sold into a satanic ritual abuse cult at six years old by her mother. I don't know what her, how her mother fits in the hierarchy. I don't know how the people who brought this child to a mansion and were the highest ranking the European rulers and raped a six-year-old. I don't know how they fit into this hierarchy, but I would suggest my gut instinct is that if we're thinking of it as purely a human hierarchy, we're kind of missing the point. And I would say this similarly, that if we're thinking of the reptilian who's raping the abductee, which we hear about in the ET encounters, as somehow fitting into this hierarchy and we're going to slot him or her in there or there. I don't think we have the ability to do that in a way that is reliable. I agree because we just, we, we can't really look into the minds of these individuals, right? We have to also leave open the possibility that there is direct entity possession of people. And this goes way back into the ancient past. And we wouldn't and, even know where to slot those entities. Uh, I can even give you some some data points here, which I actually wrote down before the show, because we didn't really discuss much of this. We're just really opening cans of worms here. But according to Wikipedia on spirit possession, I'll just quote this sentence, quote, in a 1969 study funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, Spirit possession beliefs were found to exist in 74% of a sample of 488 societies in all parts of the world. So 74% of societies. That's a great, that there is that's a great quote. Wikipedia finally pays off. Yes. And I just think you've just got to follow the data with these things. And there's too much speculation, too much philosophizing without really getting the feet firmly on the ground of the data itself. Right. But but I'm going to drill on this a little bit further. I, I'm suggesting that that data, again, is e even when we creep closer to it, it's all about exactly what you're doing, is that the data moves us closer to being a little bit less wrong. We're always going to be wrong, but a little bit less wrong. But where, where I see a lot of people going with that, and it seemed like you were with me and you agreed, is that the implications of that are unclear. The implications of where we would slot the d demon that's possessing someone in the hierarchical structure is unclear to us. Just like it's unclear where we would slot somebody who is out there living right next to us, that you're going to walk past the street that is an advanced human being of a spiritual order that we can't really understand. Maybe that person would be slotted like way, way up there. I don't think we know. And I think we, we make the mistake when we assume that, that th this order is somehow within our grasp. I don't think it is. No, I agree. I agree with that because how do we even define what is a more evolved being if we can just use this hierarchy as a structure? We've identified this in the data, but how do we even define what is then a more advanced being? For instance, the typical ancient religious view was that, especially in the East, in India and in Tibet, was that the the more advanced being was just just 
beyond the physical and had released the attachments of the physical, so to speak, and was in uh, freedom from the chain of birth, death and rebirth. But this is going to open a huge can of worms here because I haven't actually heard anyone say this before, but I was reading about what Carl Gustav Jung, the psychologist, wrote about his UFO experience because he wrote a book on UFOs as well. And he relates a dream that he had where he was by a lake in this dream. And it seems very, very vivid and real. And on the edge of the lake, there was this light, which was obvious to him, grew larger and became a UFO. And from this, this UFO came this beam of light and it shone on him. And somehow he had this intuition, this feeling that he, Carl Gustav Jung, the individual, was actually a projection of the UFO, so that he was created by the UFO. And this, to me, was absolutely mind-blowing when I started thinking about this, because I respect Carl Gustav Jung's, just his, his audacity just to open up these, these more hidden fields and just his experiences to relate them. And it just seems so bizarre that a UFO would actually be creating yourself, your own ego, your own physical body. And then I started to wonder, was this, to get back to the very beginning, was this reincarnation experience in quotation marks that I had, was this a projection, some sort of telepathic sort of reality that I saw that was completely controlled by this UFO? But how do I actually know that this was real, what I saw? Maybe it was just like seeing a movie, a film, by this UFO of something that it wanted me to see, but it has no basis whatsoever in reality, like as a historical reality. I'm totally with you. I, and I, I, I really appreciate where you're going with that. Historical reality, again, that, that is just another looking glass, another lens through which to look at. And I guess I always come back to this point. All the data, all the data sets we have suggest that we have the most disadvantaged viewpoint of all this shit, right? So it's like, if you're going to process that back in the here and now reality, everything we have tells us, man, you're, you're kind of at a, at, a, at a loss. Like people who have transcendent experience and say, I knew everything. I knew the answer to all the physics questions I could even ask in my head. They immediately came to me. And then I came back and I don't have it anymore. I had, you know, the unlimited telepathic and spiritual powers and I don't have them anymore. So I just think I just got to check myself, check you when we come back and say, okay, now I'm here now in this time space reality and I'm contemplating what Young wrote in his book. It's like, cool, but realize we're really at a disadvantage when we do that. Oh, absolutely. I agree with you there. But there are other, just looking at it at this level of recollection, right? That Jung is recollecting what he was experiencing and I'm recollecting what I experienced. And I can say as well, like uh, Richard Dolan, the he had an excellent um, video recently on the psychology of aliens. And we can just, let's just call them aliens for now, right? I, th I prefer the term UFO being because it's more open. But, but he just made the amazing point that these tall greys, that they, they seem to be really scary if you just think about it. But so often these experiences are reporting that they are feeling these overwhelming feelings of love. And Dolan is just making, just putting these two together and just saying, like, how is this even possible? These people are experiencing more love, reportedly anyway, than they've ever experienced before in the presence of these tall greys. And this, this just to me just shows that these beings seem to be able to manipulate our consciousness, our feelings to such an enormous degree. For instance, Ray Hernandez, another example who you've interviewed, he was, was going down the stairs and just had this thought put into his head seemingly. Just this is nonsense, seeing this UFO down with his wife healing the dog and he just walks up to the bed, right? And it's just so controlling, it's extreme control. That's a screen memory, by the way, you know, I, I was stumbling with the term. That's a great example of a of a screen memory or an implanted thought. If we take into consideration this data, 
that these UFO beings are extremely telepathic and can control people's thoughts and feelings and actions to such a huge degree, including overwhelming feelings of love that they've never experienced to such a degree, that we have to leave it on the table that maybe NDEs are also a manipulation, that it's not the foundation of reality, that it could be the UFOs manipulating our consciousness while we're somehow loosened from our physical bonds. Totally, totally a possibility. It just doesn't add up to me. It's like the super psi explanation for after death communication. It doesn't really make any sense if you if you think it through because it doesn't fit the reported phenomenon that you hear all the time. It's also like when I hear about the simulation theory that we're living in a simulation, you know, and the same thing I would say here, we are, they are somehow projecting a feeling of infinite love and oneness simulation. Simulation of what? What are they simulating? This is again, this is now outside of time and space. It's outside of our physical, emotional, you know, brain-based experience, chemical kind of thing, right? Because near-death experience, we no longer have a brain, we no longer have a body to process it at a biochemical level. So if ET is doing that, what are they simulating? To me, I would read it as they're simulating something that is real, is authentic, and they're trying to co-opt it in some way. Possible, or for instance, that there's a layer of, of, say, a field of, let's say, Rupert Sheldrake's morphic resonance field, let's just say, just to hypothesize this. And that it's something so subtle that we can't measure with our current instruments, but that somehow we are then experiencing reality, so to speak, within this, within this layer of our consciousness, but it's not the ultimate foundation of reality. And that somehow these UFO beings are you able to manipulate this more subtle reality and give us experiences which are so vivid, so real seeming and filled with so much emotion. And it is still on this sort of intermediary level between physical normal consciousness and the ultimate foundation of, let's say, some idealistic universe of, of consciousness is immaterial and completely free of material. See, so again, you know, a possibility and certainly something that has to be thrown on the table and considered as an explanation for some of these cases. It doesn't, to me, fit with the overall data on the near-death experience experience, because one thing I always try and remind people of with the near-death experience is you, you almost have to bifurcate it into, into two parts. One is, is it evidential of extended consciousness? And you go, boom, 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 over and over again. Okay, it is. So back to this getting past scientific materialism, we're there. From that, then, can we make certain assumptions? Can we begin to find patterns in the stories, in the accounts? And I think we can. Again, you referenced Jeff Long. Statistically, you start seeing patterns that y y you can't totally go there, but you can say, hey, that that doesn't really, that seems to be pointing towards something. You know, I, I, yes. I always reference the Netflix excellent special, Surviving Death, I think is the name of it, by Leslie Kane again, who did a fantastic job. But the, the opening scene of that six-part series on Netflix is this woman who, her name escapes him right now, but she's become quite famous. She was a, a, a doctor and quite an, quite an accomplished doctor, and she was kayaking down in Central America. And her kayak turned over, and she was underwater for 20 minutes, and she died, and she had a near-death experience, classic near-death experience. The crux or the, the real kind of point of her near-death experience is she reaches a point where many end years do, where she actually has a choice. Again, this speaks to the issue of free will philosophically. The choice, shall she return to her life as she knew it, or shall she stay in this other realm? She chooses to return as she's walking out the door. And this makes no sense to me. I don't know how to make sense of it, but this is her account as she's quote unquote walking out the door. I'm kidding. They go, oh, by the way, your son, sorry, but he only has 10 years to live. 
so she returns and her husband and her are living with this, which is unimaginable to me, you know, having kids, that your son has 10 years to live. But they're like, we don't know. You know, life is life is a mystery. Who knows? And this and that. So 10 years pass. And they're like cautiously celebrating because he hasn't died. Within several months, he walks out into the street and is hit by a bus and is killed. So that account to me doesn't sound like E.T. And the hundreds and hundreds of other accounts that I've read don't sound like E.T. They sound like more what we'd identify as genuine compassion, genuine love, genuine experiences of the highest order of feelings of this spirituality that we all experience at our best and and most profound times that is uplifting. And the counter to that, I think, would have to fit inside of some other paradigm. So if there is another paradigm in which that would fit, then I think you have to offer some kind of explanation for how that would work and even what would be the goals of such such a paradigm. And all those wind with me sounding very materialistic, sound very much like, well, the aliens needed to collect gold to get their atmosphere back. They sound so not spiritual that they are almost a non-starting point. Okay, I, I agree with you on your analysis of the data, just on the data of the NDEs, right? We can establish that with enough surety, I think, that that is a genuine pattern, that there is this uh, love is hugely important and that there are hierarchies, that there's God. And, and let me just that. add, I have, to, I have to add one thing, because it's an important distinction. It's not a feeling of love, right? Because it can't be a feeling of love. Because when we use that language, we are talking about a biochemical reaction inside of this biology that we walk around with. And these people, and it's an important point from the near-death experience, we know they are relieved of that, of, of, of those requirements. They no longer have a physiology that could process that biochemical reaction. So we would have to speculate on that whole level as well. Yeah, that speculation as well, because um, <laughs> we could call it a, a sensation or a a, well, what, what, what could we even call it? I don't know, but I think it is a, it's an assumption that you can't experience what we could in quotation marks call feelings in these out-of-body experiences, uh, in these non-corporeal experiences, because we're just assuming that one can't. But I, I, know, I know this is the, the reported experience of these people, that they can't feel, for instance, the same sort of drives that they of fear and things that that they seem to have had before but i still think that they can feel certain things for instance love and sometimes fear and yeah but nelson i'm i'm saying it more from a kind of uh, nuts and bolts materialistic standpoint if you're going to drag along the whole biochemical reaction inside the body and the and inside the brain which people want to do that is gone so whatever you're going to speculate about you can, whoever it is you're saying can spill, still experience the feelings, you're going to have to leave behind all the neurology, all the physiology, all the biochemistry associated with what we commonly talk about as experiencing feelings, you know, and you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so we just have to be open, I think, to the possibility that when you're in these altered uh, states of not being corporeal, that you're you can still sense certain things, certain longings as well, for instance, see loved ones again. And I just think it would be close-minded just to assume that certain sensations are only physical, such as love or fear or longing, because it doesn't seem to fit with the data. Well, but my point is once you get there, then kind of all bets are off, because now you're talking about your... Uh, shape shifting reptilian, and, and you 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 just have no, you you're, you have no way of really talking about what a shape shifting reptilian is. When we talk about you experiencing what you're, 
you experiencing what your brain is setting off in your head, that's one thing. And if we talk about that shape-shifting reptilian coming in and raping a loved one of yours, we can talk about that. But as soon as we shift to that other realm, again, kind of all bets are off. We, we, don't, we don't even know what your experience is anymore. We can't directly establish causation, right? We can't really establish that, but I would just go back to this looking at patterns again. And this is going to come into the psyop angle of things. And that if you look at what Richard Dolan was describing of the tall greys and the reported experiences of these people of overwhelming love, and you compare this to the near-death experience reports of this overwhelming love, and then you look at, for instance, the New Testament, and it's all about love. Love is all that matters. And yeah, it is very much just on this Jesus character. But we also look at the um, counterculture in the 60s, 1960s with the Beatles, all you need is love. And I just started to get a little bit suspicious of this. Why is it always just love? Why is it all only about that and not about, for instance, material accomplishments in this world? Why is it always just love? And I just started to get suspicious that this was some sort of psyop. And I'm not saying it is. I'm just throwing it out there as a devil's advocate, right? Right. It, it, so the only thing, and this is going to hopefully get us into this kind of last topic that we wanted to talk about, because I want to talk about the Romans. I want to talk about the Christian psyop. And I want to. It's been an absolutely terrific chat. Nelson, where do we go from here? Where do you go from here? Are you writing about this, publishing any of this, or is it just cooking up there in your brain? It's it's in the cooking mode at the moment, and I'll I'll be in touch with you after the show, and I'll send you some links as well. Okay, I don't even have a website yet, so I'll but I'll I'll give you some links of I'll start some things up as well because I am planning on actually writing a historical novel, and I've like even David Matheson in our discussions with each other, he recommended I wrote, write a book, and I really appreciate his work by the way, David Matheson. So I don't want to be too harsh on some of these. Uh, great thinkers and researchers. Yeah. Great. Well, it's been terrific. And thanks again, Nelson. We'll, we'll stay in touch. All right. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks again to Nelson for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I tee up from this interview is, what do you make of Nelson's suspicion about love in the extended consciousness realm? I love the the pullback, the paranoia, the conspiratorial mindset. It's so importantly refreshing from a from an academic from an academically trained real philosopher from a from a really deep thinker, academically trained deep thinker like Nelson. It's quite refreshing. And I think it took us in so many interesting ways. But what do you think about his theory? Let me know. Come to the Skeptico Forum like Nelson did and make some brilliant comments. I'd love to find you there. Until next time, take care and bye for now.